thanks for having me, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for this opportunity to talk on this uh, topic today. It's given me um, a great pleasure to uh, reminisce over the past nine years on this theme and reflect on some of the work I've been doing. Um, and then sort of think about what it means to be sort of good architecture when it's at such a monumental scale. And so as a way of starting this topic, I sort of thought about uh, the Melbourne skyline. So something we can all recognise. And some of those early questions was, well, how does it make you feel? Um, you know, and for me, driving back from the beach, I would see it as a marketplace. I'd have a bit of a sense of pride because some of those towers I've, I've had the pleasure to working on, um, especially the, the one in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, so yeah, but the difference is when you get up and stand from underneath it, like what, what is that feeling? You know, and I'd ask, you know, is it, is it a sense of awe? Is it this sort of great, massive, uh, you know, monument? Or is it, is it overbearing? And um, I think by thinking of this theme monumental, I've started to sort of try and work out where that distinction is. And somewhere where I've landed is um, the, the image on the right-hand side, which I came across on a site visit in Chengdu. And it's, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, shopping centre in the world. So it's, it's 500 metres by 400 wide, which is almost two times the size of that tower. Uh, in, in dimension. And what I sort of think is funny about it is, is, is not necessarily its scale, but its scalelessness. Like you, you can't really tell how big it is by just looking at it. You have to come up to it and see it. And when we think of when an idea, an object, something gets so big that we can't sort of recognize its scale, like how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel confused? You know, is that ambiguity something that puts you off? And I guess I'm sort of saying maybe that is. And, and as a way of trying to position this idea of like big buildings and how they can make you feel good, you know, we need to sort of connect more to humans and the scale and being able to read it. And a way of trying to think about this um, and also a way to share uh, some pictures of my recent holiday, I was thinking of nature. So we were sitting at um, the hazards down in Coles Bay and we were looking out at these towers having breakfast and I was like, well, why does this make me feel good? You know, this is of a monumental scale. These, these mountains sitting across the contrast of the skyline, you know, this distinct place, you know, it, it's sort of calming. Well, I thought, that's great from a distance, but my issues were up close and personal, so I'd have to go take a closer look. And that's where this photo from the right-hand side... In retrospect, the photo was already taken and this was chosen later for the task. But um, what I discovered as I got closer, by understanding something from a distance, seeing sort of it's made up of trees and paths and rocks, things that I could grasp and understand, it made it more understandable and made it more calming. So I started to think along the lines of, you know, this sense of human scale from a distance, something we can connect to, connect to the body, and so that's the sort of, sort of key things that have started to establish. These distinct markers, creating a sense of sort of belonging. And then also getting up and close and having that connection to the human body and what, what you can grasp. But what happens if, uh, if that, that doesn't, doesn't sort of eventuate? And I sort of started to think about cities and this is another image of, of Chengdu and on, on this sort of site visit. And here you can see an array, like a patchwork quilt of, of different tower developments. And so imagine there's, there's sort of 10 towers per plot with all the same tower and it's, it's quite um, overbearing and scary. And, and the predicament when we're building architecture is that you have to remove a lot of the city, a lot of something to put something new there. And that can sort of pull out its relationship to place. So you have to sort of think of a way to re-establish that. In order to build something like an apartment, it has to have a lot of repetition. So lots of floors, lots of balconies. So, so this sort of 
something more like nature where I was talking about these sort of paths and trees and things, all those things emerge naturally. Every, when you walk around a sort of mountain, it changes constantly. You can't pick up on these patterns. Here, we're dealing constantly with repetition. So it's sort of like, how do we create an emerging pattern? Um, so, so this was the sort of, the, I guess, the, the issues that, that we face. Um, but going on from there, it's not all bad. Uh, when I was in Japan, I, um, I was working for this architect called Kengo Kuma. And this, this would be one of my favorite buildings. I, I, haven't, I didn't work on this building, but I did, I did get to talk to it in competitions and, and describe it to, to people. But this is uh, an art gallery in Dundee in Scotland. And uh, the idea here in particular is what it's, was its connection to place and what that means and what that does. So the building itself is made up of these two volumes that twist and contort in such a way to align to the city axes and then align to an axis connected to an old heritage ship. And, and what that does, it sort of strikes a line and, and puts, puts it in the, in the viewer's eye. And, and, a, and a great example of that is the shrine. So if you stand anywhere on Swanson Street and you look down, you can see the shrine sitting right at the end of the, uh, right at the end. And, and that sort of puts it in the place of the viewer, you know, marking that this is an important, you know, important part of time. And so what's happened since this building has been in this position, um, it's become a beacon for the artist community. Like everyone is flocking towards Dundee because they have a place for, for their sort of cultural uh, institution. And, and so in trying to embed these things, once, once you're trying to create this sense of place, um, it's, it's super important. Um, but again, what happens when you get up close? So one of the keys to the building is its, uh, its position on the river and the way it sort of contorts and and twists is in reminiscent of the cliffs of Scotland. So again, taking on uh, a metaphor in a way, uh, telling a bit of a story about the local place through, through its form, its twisting, but also it's through its material. And then what is it made up of? This sort of similar scale that you can understand from a distance and from up and close, you, you can, it, it sort of resonates with you, your, your body. You, you start to be able to understand it. Uh, it's made of these, these concrete plinths. Now, what's, what's interesting, these things are really heavy, but in a way they're made to feel light. Um, and then they're also sort of in a way porous, allowing them to twist. So it's sort of like this inviting scale. It's this building that twists and turns and changes from every perspective, which sort of creates a bit of a naturalness. You can tell it's not part of nature, but it feels, it feels like it. So that... That leads me to, to my own work with, uh, at John Wardle Architects. And uh, this is the project that I've been working on for the last three years. And it sort of starts with a, another predicament, a clean slate. There's actually nothing in this area when we've sort of started to, to think about these issues, you know. We're building a city almost of 11 towers uh, how do we create this sense of place? How do we connect to the, the environment was already there? Um, so, you know, obviously a series of issues. And there's, there's two sites there which I'll, I'll talk into deeper. And one of them in the bottom left-hand corner you can see is well into construction and, and will finish at the, at the end of um, this year. So here's the, uh, the two projects that I'll, I'll have a talk about. And... Um, yeah, the first one, Eco Lakes, which is, is under construction, made up of, of eight towers. And then the second one, the Bamboo Forest. So Eco Lakes is, uh, it's all multi-residential towers, um, ranging from 20 to 40 storeys tall. And one thing that I wanted to talk about just in this image is about composition. So the the client had given us a series of, like a site plan and a series of towers and heights. And, <clears throat> and we had to think of ways to make them feel more natural, feel more inviting, feel more dynamic. 
as you move around, you want to not read as many uh, relationships that make everything feel too man, too man made or sort of developer driven. You want to, you know, it wants to be aesthetically uh, delightful in a way. And part of this was looking at the skyline in, in order to not make it feel like this ascension from, um, I guess, the left hand side to the right hand side because there's a sort of prominence to one area. We started to talk to how we could create variance in the, in the height. So creating a bit of more dynamic silhouette of the, the skyline. But the issue was that we were starting with nothing. We had to, uh, we had to create something to connect to. And one of the terms we use at John Wardle Architects is this idea of invented logic. So we started at something uh, scalable and understand it to, to the body. The, a, a courtyard house, which um, in Chinese architecture is quite common, a garden that is surrounded by buildings. And we said, well, how do we scale that up to a tower size? And what would that mean? And so we started looking uh, at different perspectives and angles. And I think it, as designers, we, we sort of have to be empathetic to the end user and, and give them, you know, sort of try and understand their experience. So here you can see looking down onto the garden that might be part of your tower area and then or looking up and, and trying to break something down so it's not overbearing. Um, and so here you can see the actual extent of that site, the, the diagram on the left-hand side. It's sort of made up of all these large courtyards that the towers then connect to. We had to take an approach where, with these large, extremely large sites, how do we break them down into smaller bits? How do we make them approachable and, and achievable? You know, it's sometimes you have to sort of step out and see the whole, the whole site, but we need a way to get in. And by using these courtyards uh, that would allow the building's facade and allow the balconies to, to reach out and grasp, we, we gave ourselves a scale that we could deal with maybe one or two to three towers at a time. And the importance of this was also giving the people that would live there a sense of place that they can come to. Their, their garden is in front of their building. Um, and so although we didn't have something in the city to grasp, we had to create something that we could hold on to. Then what's the next scale that we break something down at? In order to in order to uh, create variance in the facade, in order to make the buildings feel, uh, I guess, less robotic, we started to uh, think of how to break these towers down. And we decided to choose three floor plates, um, which you can sort of see stacked uh, on top of each other in the bottom left-hand corner. And in order to create that variance, we created different levels of com uh, different combinations that would um, allow the towers to feel more random. The idea is you can't really create randomness. You have to create a rule that allows sort of randomness to emerge. Um, but then what at a deeper level, how does that connect to people? So we looked at the human scale. How could we create something uh, that could connect? You know, how can you look up from below and say, that's my balcony? So we, we looked at uh, the balconies that were sort of gesturing side to side and how we could fill them with uh, a terracotta, earthy toned uh, tile that would allow them to illuminate. So when you're looking up, you're able to see where you are, you know, where your balcony is, and that would create a colour wave across the towers, which would sort of break down that scale even further. And then finally, here's, this, here's an image of, of how that all comes together. You can see uh, the courtyard and how the towers like grasp and hold onto them, sort of creating that sense of place. And then how from below looking up, you can see a level of variance in the, in the facade, in the buildings that is probably controllable rather than just random. You can see the, the tones coming out of, of those insides of the balconies. Second project uh, is called the Bamboo Forest. So, this was uh, the, actual, the actual site next door, and we were given a completely different uh, 
series of, I guess, issues and challenges to, to answer to. And here you can see we were given three Y-shaped towers. Uh, the fourth tower there was by another architect. And the client turned to us and said, well, how do you make them tall and skinny? These Y-shaped towers were, were flat. When you looked at them straight on, you just saw a wall of, of buildings and repetition. And that, that created a predicament. We wanted to create variance and softness. So through a series of tests, we took the ends of the towers and out of these ovals, which would become balconies. And then there we got to this idea, all right, well, there might just be these repetitive cylinders in a way. So the next step was trying to profile the edges in order to create a bit of definition. And it started to come across as this idea of a, a piece of bamboo. So imagine the sort of curving edges of the bamboo. And then from there, it kind of becomes easy. We've decided it's the bamboo stalk or the bamboo tower. So once you sort of grasp this idea of a story or a concept, you use that in every way to test the success of the next development. So the next question was, how do we deal with the rooftops? Maybe we have to cut them as though it's a piece of bamboo in order to allow them to uh, be more defined from the next one. And then it goes even further. So we've got this bamboo towers. We've also been given, in the foreground you can see here, is sort of green undulating land. We were asked to design a whole retail precinct. As we worked through different options, we came to maybe it needs to be more connected and integrated, like a holistic concept. So the bamboo towers perfectly land into this undulating forest floor, creating the bamboo forests. Once we started thinking this is a, a full story, it made it feel like, yes, there is going to be a sense of place. It's going to feel holistic and, and purposeful. Um, it feels like it'll be a nice place to be. And then as we start to use sort of nature to define and think about the moves that we're making, and this one might be a little bit hard to grasp, but you can see the levels like in, in the diagram and some of them step down. But what's interesting about how the levels are, are, are intersected uh, is how, <laughs> how do I explain this? <laughs> We, we, in order to create courtyards and, and flat moments, we think of it as pooling water. So when you look at the diagram, there's a naturalness. So you can see there's a courtyard where lots of people are gathering. In a way to make that feel natural, you know, you imagine the water's pooling at the bottom and you cut that line perfectly. So you're starting to use nature as a way to make all these decisions as you go. You know, you, this big con concept overarching, you know, defines it. But then these buildings can't be sculptures, so how do we, how do we create a, a rule or a pattern and allow something to emerge? So we looked at the three stalks, we created a series of sequences, nine, seven, five, and then we rearranged them in different parts of the towers so nothing would align. We don't want one stalk to perfectly align to the next. It's, it's quite simple, but when you look at them, it tricks your eye. Everything starts to disappear. And it's, it's really important to uh, create these emergent patterns. Um, but then how do you take that further? When you look at nature, you might find cues that give you more answers in how you can create or make your concept even stronger. Another thing we looked at was, well, we only have the balcony to work with in order to create this uh, this stalk, this, this sort of bamboo shape. So it's all about this horizontality. So we, we started looking at colour. And in order to create contrast and make this big Y shape disappear from below, we, we gave it a recessive colour, which is that dark grey. In order to make it really pop, these green stalks, we faded from green into the sort of white. So imagine like when you sort of close your knuckles, that white is the highest contrast to the black. So the fattest part of the ring, the, the most defined part of the stalk, is the highest contrast to that colour from below. So, and you can see looking at the, uh, the picture of the bamboo, how that's sort of, um, sort of connecting there. And finally, 
you can see the whole uh, composition together. And here you can see the, the sort of undulating landscape, which is the retail. And then in a similar way, this sort of vertically undulating stalks that uh, aim to read as these nine skinny towers rather than three large fat towers. Um, but yeah, so I guess to summarise, thinking about these uh, buildings, these large developments, it's been an important thing to how we can break down the scale of our ideas, how to, how to create a sense of place through some of this, these concepts, through you know, creating this courtyard for us to surround or through even just telling a story about the bamboo forest and, and connecting these things together. Um, but then partly as well, it's about tricking the eye and, and trying to create a human scale for us co to connect to. Uh, thank you.